Hello, everybody. <clears throat> Sorry. Hello, everybody. It's Dr. Joe here in the house as usual. And uh, on this Wednesday evening, I hope you are well, wherever you are. And as usual, let me know who you are and in the chat room and where you're tuning in from. I'll definitely give you a little shout out uh, and so on. So we've got another great session today. And we're going to talk about uh, path to prosperity, how, how top investors succeed. And um, so as you can see my background, the idea here is that, uh, you know, it's helping each other. And uh, I want to share with you some of the, you know, some of the tips, some of the uh, suggestions from uh, my experience and also from others, uh, top investors, uh, you know, who share their wisdoms on different strategies that they pursue. And, uh, and that's the reason why I, I decided to pick this topic. I think it's going to be fun. And we're going to talk about lots of different strategies, buy and hold, fix and flip, wholesaling, uh, short-term rentals, house hacking, lease options, syndications, lien, uh, tax liens. There's a whole bunch of stuff we're going to talk about today. And as usual, there's not just one way. There's multiple ways. And uh, we're going to talk about the pros and cons of either. And uh, hopefully it'll help you. Now, uh, if you're... Uh, if you're not part of my social uh, media network, either Instagram or um, Facebook, please uh, sign up and uh, you know, you know, join me, and uh, you know, and so on. So we, we pose the question. Uh, we'll call it the question of the day, and uh, the question of the day, which we post on social media, uh, Instagram and Facebook, is what do you what do you understand by the term? successful real estate investors so i want to know from you what what is what do you think a successful real estate investor is and i have my ideas i'd like to hear your ideas uh you can put it in the chat room today or you can um you know uh share with me a dm or put it on instagram and facebook uh, and so i'll share with you my thoughts at the end of today's session but the, the the question of the day is what do you understand by the term successful real estate investor and as usual Enter your questions in the chat box. We're going to go to Q and A. Ask Dr. Joe at the end of today's session, and uh, and so on. So, uh, what's it called? So, I suppose let's get down to it. So, uh, in terms of uh, you know the topic, which is uh, you know uh, path to prosperity, how top investors succeed. The question is going to be how can investors pave their path to prosperity in residential real estate investing. I'm going to be focused on residential real estate. I'm not going to talk about commercial, industrial, and all those other sectors. Uh, I'm just going to focus on residential real estate because that's where I think most of uh, you know the, the viewers, my viewers anyway, are focused on. So, uh, you, know, you know, you watch those late night movies or infomercials where they always make it sound like it's easy uh, to become uh, rich, wealthy, whatever you want to call it, successful in real estate investing. They make it sound so easy. Uh, but you and I always know that it's not as easy as what they make it to be. Uh, take it from me. I've been doing this for about 35 years, and I've been through trials and tribulations. It's not easy. I'm not saying it's difficult. I'm not saying it's impossible. I'm just saying it's not easy. It does require knowledge, a strategy, and also it does require a certain level of perseverance. Uh, there are setbacks and you got to be able to pull yourself up and keep going and learn from those mistakes and just keep moving forward. And so what I'm going to talk about today is some of the lessons and strategies, lessons learned from my experience and other successful real estate investors from different niches. And, um, you know, as you know, I do buy and hold, but there are a lot of other strategies which we'll talk about today. And hopefully, uh, you know, there's no one way. There's lots of different ways. And you pick the one that makes the most sense for you. Um, and, uh, whichever one you pick, there are definitely, uh, rules of the game. It does require knowledge. It does require strategy and it does require perseverance. If you don't have that, then you're going to, you, you're going to need to get it. Otherwise take it from me. You will not, I, I repeat, you will not be successful. Uh, that you near know, navigating real estate, um, you know, is a dynamic environment. Things are always changing. It can be a little daunting, uh, especially if you're new to investing, uh, but there are lots of other people. There are lots of people wherever you're located who have, um, in my opinion, anyway, uh, have figured it out. And so, what you want to do is try to associate with them, uh, and so you can learn and leverage from. You can learn from their mistakes. So hopefully, you won't make unnecessary mistakes. Uh, obviously, I I will share with you what I think. But there are lots of other people uh, who can also share with you some wisdom. So today's uh, session. 
Uh, I'm going to give a lot of actionable uh, advice. Uh, I do believe in actionable rather, as opposed to theoretical, real world. And so after each session or each niche, I'm going to give you, you know, three or four actionable items that you can take today uh, if, that, you know, if the niche that uh, I discussed is of interest to you. And uh, I'm going to map out uh, really, a, a, I'm going to provide at least a little roadmap, roadmap to success and, um, you know, and so on. So let's just get down to the different strategies. And the first one we're going to talk about is uh, fix and flip. And uh, fix and flip strategy is a strategy which a lot of people want to do is for, it's for what I call quick turn. And uh, the idea is uh, you can make chunks of money and you can maximize your returns through renovations. So a lot of people pursue uh, fix and flip strategy because they want to earn chunks of cash as opposed to uh, cash flow uh, by holding on to, which I'll talk about in a minute. So really, at the end of the day, uh, the question you're going to ask is, uh, how can investors maximize their returns by renovating distressed properties? And that's what we took. Uh, you know, when I'm talking about fix and flip, the idea is that uh, you know you're buying a property. Typically, it's in a state of disrepair. It needs some work. Um, you know, something's going on with the house. It could be simple, uh, minor modifications, minor renovations. It could be middle level. It could be major. But something is going on with the house which requires some work to be done. And what you're going to do is to purchase this distressed property. You're going to renovate this property, and then you're probably going to sell it, turn around and sell it for a, uh, you know for a profit. And that's what we do when we are pursuing the um, a fix and flip strategy. And uh, but again, you know, to be successful in this strategy, it does require an understanding of your market, your local market, where you tend, where you're intending to buy your property. There are local dynamics uh, which you need to be aware of. I mean, what's going on in Washington D.C. It may not be the same as what's going on in. Um, Tuscaloosa, Alabama, or or in Austin, Texas, or whatever. There are local dynamics that you really do need to understand uh, about the market that you're um, you're going in. You're also going to under, you're going to need to understand renovation costs. What's the cost of doing rehabs? What's the cost of updating kitchen, bathrooms, taking out walls? Um, typically, if you're going to do major renovations, you're going to need some uh, permits. So you're going to need to understand uh, the permitting arrange. Uh, you know. Um, permitting process wherever you are and uh, some places you know you as a homeowner can go out and get building permits sometimes you're going to need an architect to develop plans and then you're going to have to navigate it through the you know the building department wherever your local area is and sometimes they're very easy to work through sometimes they're very difficult so you're going to need to understand that well you're going to need to have people who understand that process such that if you do require permits you can get it through uh, and if you do need permits, you better have the permits because uh, you don't want to do work without permits if you need permits. Uh, a lot of people do. I don't recommend it because um, huh, you can be, run afoul, let's just say, of the uh, local authority and they may uh, put what we call a stop work order on you and they may do what they call, uh, they may fine you and uh, and it could cost you a lot of money uh, if you, uh, you know, don't have the right permits in place. So it's really important. And so it does require understanding of the, uh, you know, the market, the renovation process, renovation cost, financials of that, and also marketing strategy because you're going to turn around and sell the property. So it does require you to have some knowledge about marketing. And so hopefully you can sell the property quickly so you can turn around and recoup your uh, monies and then make a profit. Uh, Season uh, fix and flip uh, investors. Uh, I think they tend to focus on making sure they do due diligence before they go out there and buy a property, especially in markets like where we are today, which is kind of, um, you know, it's kind of a, a transitioning market. Um, you know, so you don't want to buy a property, renovate it, and then you're trying to sell it and you can't because the market's turned on you. And, uh, and therefore, the only way you can offload the property is to reduce the price, which is going to cut into your profits. And hopefully, well, not hopefully, but, you know, if you're not careful, you may end up losing money. And I've done that. That's happened to me before where I've done rehabs mm -hmm. and uh, the market turned on me and I uh, couldn't get rid of this stuff. I had to reduce the prices. I ended up making no money uh, after uh, going through painful, uh, you know, processes. So it, it's not easy. 
Uh, and anybody who tells you fix and flips are easy, I think it's misleading you. It's not. Uh, also, successful um, fix and flippers, they understand the importance of having a reliable team, whether it be um, you know, contractors, inspectors, real estate agents, and bird dogs, and uh, wholesalers, and so on. It's really important to, to have the right team in place that can help you, um, you know, streamline the renovation and also the uh, deal finding and also maximize profitability. So while fix and flip can be a lucrative strategy, it can be. It also has its fair share of challenges. It's not easy. And, um, you know, I've done projects where the budgets have been blown. You know, I thought it was going to cost X number of dollars to do this rehab. We run into problems. We find things that we didn't expect. Uh, we have to do change orders you know had issues with the contractors and you know and next thing you know the 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 the, the rehab itself is ballooned out of control and uh and you know if you're not careful you run out of money so unexpected renovation cost happens uh as i said mentioned before fluctuating market conditions can can uh, occur you don't want to be the guy or the girl uh, standing up when the music stops uh that's not a pretty situation the market, you know, you, you buy, as a lot of people buy during the good times. And by the time they rehab the house and get ready to sell it, the market's changed, the market slowed down, and now they're stuck with this uh, property. So market conditions is, can be a real, real uh, pain. And obviously, you're going to need to navigate the various obstacles uh, all along the way uh, in terms of the rehab. So, uh, it, you know, it, it can be a very successful strategy, a very lucrative strategy. strategy. Uh, I've done some fix and flips. I've made some money. I've lost some money. And uh, if that's something that appeals to you, I think, uh, you know, you definitely want to pursue it. But be careful. And here are some action items that you may want to consider if you're going to uh, pursue the fix and flip strategy in terms of implementation. One is make sure you do con uh, conduct comprehensive analysis and due diligence uh, of the market that you're in, the property that you're going to purchase, um, you know, including... Um, you know, the renovation cost estimation. Okay. Number two action item you want to consider is to build a reliable uh, team uh, of contractors, inspectors, wholesalers, real estate agents, and uh, to really streamline your process. Another uh, action item is develop a marketing strategy to attract potential buyers because you want to get rid of this thing once you fix it up. So you're going to need to have a pool of buyers. So you want to be able to have a strategy to attract buyers. And also maximize, obviously, the sale property, sale price. And uh, the final action item you may want to consider is to monitor the market. You don't want to, uh, you know, the market changes and cause you to be surprised. And so market monitor market trends and adjust your renovation uh, plans and budgets accordingly to maximize profitability. So that's number one, first strategy, which is the fix and flip. Let's go to number two strategy. I've got so many strategies. I don't think I'm going to have enough time. But I'll just keep going. Uh, the second strategy uh, I'm going to talk about is the buy and hold strategy, uh, which is the one that I, um, you know, very much into, and primarily to build long-term wealth through rental properties. So that's the strategy number two we're going to talk about is buy and hold. And the question is, what strategies and can investors, what things can we do as investors to uh, to build long-term wealth through rental properties? I kind of talk about that right now and uh and so on so buy and hold investing for those people who don't know is the idea of buying a house or property holding on to it for a long term and uh through renting the property getting the income and uh and over time hopefully anyway the property increases in value you, you know you can increase the rents to get more cash flow and you can really leverage the power of real estate uh, which is cash flow tax benefits um you know appreciation equity build up and also the ability to leverage these are some of the benefits of real estate that you can get if you decide you want to pursue the buy and hold strategy. Uh, but, uh, you know, like all things, it's not easy. And uh, if you want to pursue this strategy, you really do need to understand uh, certain things, things like property management. You're going to have to deal with tenants. So which means that managing tenant relationships. And also you're going to have to, because you're holding on to this thing, this asset, you're going to need to have a pretty good, I would say, financial management financial planning uh capabilities because you're going to be there may be times where cash flow is not there and you're going to need to bring money from other sources so financial planning and financial management is very very important if you're going to pursue the uh the, the buy and hold strategy 
So one of the key benefits of buy and hold uh, is the uh, the ability to generate what we what a lot of people call passive income. Uh, it's technically, I mean, they call it passive income, but it's you know you do require some effort. It's not too, purely passive. Uh, you, there, there are problems with the house. There are problems with your tenants. And so, you know, depending on what you do, you may have to get involved. Or if you have a management company, someone's going to have to get involved. So it's not truly passive. But uh, the, I have properties where, you know, I don't do anything, um, you know, uh, for months. I don't hear from the tenants. Uh, things are just moving, uh, you know, very well. And uh, I've got Section 8 tenants in there. So most of the rent's coming in. Uh, the tenants pay their money like clockwork and so forth. So it can be very passive. But it's not always 100% passive. So I want to kind of, uh, you know, uh, mention that. And uh, so the idea is that to rent, you want to rent, you want to find quality tenants and uh, you want to manage that tenant relationships. And hopefully you can manage the property. And in time, the property is increased in value. And if you want to exit, um, then hopefully you'll be able to benefit from the fact that you've held this uh, real asset for a period of time. Uh, my thing is that the real money, in my opinion, is uh, appreciation, especially if you're in an appreciating market. Uh, I'm in the Washington DC area, which you know is an appreciating market, it's expensive, but over time prices tend to go up. And so if you can hold on to these properties for a long time, generally it tends to work out um, you know, over the long haul. Maybe not in the short term, but over 5, 10, 15, 20 years, typically prices tend to go up. It's very, very rare that in appreciating markets, prices go down over a 5, 10, 15, 20 year period. Uh, there may be short term fluctuations like in six months, a year or two. But over the long term, it tends to go up in value. Uh, but to succeed as a buy and hold investor, you know, this is uh, some of the things which I found to be very, very important. Is uh, you got to be careful where you buy, what you buy. Uh, you want to buy in areas where you can attract desirable tenants who are going to take care of your property, be pleasant to deal with, and hopefully stay a long time. So where you buy is very, very important. It's not just buying stuff. Where you buy is also very, very important. Uh, and uh, I think that, uh, you know, that's the key. You know, it's where you buy. Uh, it may not make money today, but over the long haul, it tends to work itself out. Uh, additionally, I think the, the key is going to be, uh, in, this, in addition to just where you buy, is your abilities to manage the tenants. Um, you, know, you're, if, you, know, you need to be effective at property management. Uh, and also because you know, at the end of the day, you're dealing with human beings and your ability to work with those human beings, those tenants, because the tenants are your customers, is going to determine your success. Uh, a lot of people get too caught up in, well, I need to, um, you know, the spreadsheet says this and so on. Yes, the spreadsheet may say that. You may get this cash on cash return according to the spreadsheet, and according to the analysis. Uh, ROI is this and the IRR is that and all these other acronyms says this. But in reality, if you don't find good tenants, none of that stuff matters. Uh, because if you don't, you're going to have vacancies, you're going to have expenses and all your numbers go to naught. So uh, if you implement strong strategies for things like uh, tenant screening, proactive maintenance, and responsive in communications, you can increase the chance of success if you want to pursue this strategy of buy and hold. So what are some of the action items that you want to consider if you're going to implement this strategy? Uh, I'll give you two or three, about three or four of them. One is make sure you're good at identifying properties in desirable locations uh, where people want to actually live and rent. Okay, uh, and also where there's long term potential for appreciation. Number two action items that you may want to consider is to develop a, a thorough screening process to attract quality tenants and, and weed out the good, the bad from the ugly and uh, implement a prop, uh, proactive property management practices to maintain uh, good tenant uh, relationships and good tenant satisfaction and also uh, protect your asset in terms of the value. And also, you know, similar to the other ones, you need to monitor your market and market conditions and you adjust your rents accordingly if, uh, if you need be to maximize cash flow and also to reduce vacancies. The third strategy we're going to talk about today is wholesaling. Uh, wholesaling, um, you know, is a strategy and the idea here is to find profitable deals 
uh, you're not really holding inventory. Uh, you're not holding the asset for very long. Uh, in the uh, fix and flip and also in the buy and hold, you're actually holding the asset for a period of time. It could be months. Uh, it could be years. But in wholesaling, you're not actually um, you know, holding on and buying and keeping the property for a, a significant period of time. So the question then becomes, um, you know, how can investors profit from real estate transactions without actually holding inventory? Okay. Uh, as I said before, wholesaling uh, is a it, it's a strategy which uh, some people use. Uh, I'm not. That's not something which I do. So I'm not an expert in there. But I know quite a few wholesalers who have been very very successful. Um, I know a lot of wholesalers who think it's easy, but it's not. It's not an easy strategy. Um, you know, you, you know, you don't hold inventory. Uh, but to do that, you but to pursue this strategy, what I found is that you need to have good and strong negotiating skills. You're going to have to, you know, negotiate with a seller who's trying to sell a house. Uh, you're going to have to negotiate with a buyer who's going to buy the house from you. Uh, you're going to have a deep understanding of, uh, you're going to have to need a deep understanding of the market which you're pursuing. Um, but as I said, the core wholesaling is uh, finding a distressed property, a property that needs some, something is going on that the seller wants to get rid of it. And uh, you're going to negotiate a contract with the seller. And, uh, and then you're going to assign your contract to a potential buyer uh, for a fee. And that's where your profit is going to be. Um, so it can be a lucrative investment strategy. But it comes with its all, you know, its share of challenges. Like all things, it's never easy. Um, you know, things like uh, you got to find uh, motivated sellers. That's not always easy. You got to be able to negotiate with these motivated sellers uh, to identify or to develop favorable contracts. And then you're going to have to develop a, a network of buyers who hopefully will buy these properties from you. So you don't hold on to properties. And, uh, and you're not the one left holding the bag, as they say. So one of the key benefits of uh, wholesaling is uh, it's a lot of people pursue that is for quick profits. Uh, in theory, you can make quick money, uh, fast cash, and uh, with quote unquote minimal risk. Typically, what you have on a risk is your um, is your down payment, and your and sometimes they can negotiate that to be very very small. So the idea is that um, you know you're going to find distressed properties. And negotiate with them and then find a buyer to take it off your hands. So, you know, it negotiating skills becomes very, very important. You got to be a people person, you got to be able to market for deals, and uh, which means that you have to understand the market uh, that you're uh, actually you know, operating in. So, um, you know, also you got to know uh, a good sense of market valuation, the price of properties. Uh, I know that I get irritated sometimes with these wholesalers who. You know, my inbox is full of, you know, supposed deals. Uh, when you actually do the analysis, you find out that the numbers that they are providing you are bogus. Um, you know, typically they jack up the after repair value to make it sound like this house is worth so much afterwards. And they also underestimate typically the repair cost, how much it's going to cost to actually fix up the house. And therefore, they tend to inflate the potential profit. So it may sound great on paper, but in reality, when you actually do some digging around, it's not always as good. It's always, or it's not always what it's cracked up to be. Um, so you know, don't always take the wholesalers' numbers for on face value. Uh, they have their own agenda, and you want to make sure that you're looking out for your own agenda, your agenda, your agenda as well. So, uh, it, but it can be a very profitable strategy. I know some wholesalers doing very, very well. And, um, you know, especially when they're in, during the heyday, when there's lots of buyers out there. And, uh, you know, so the key is to find profitable deals and, uh, and they can maximize, you can maximize profits very, and your returns on, uh, on this strategy. It's, it's a good one. So what are some of the action items if you want to pursue this strategy? Uh, build a network of motivated sellers and buyers through networking events, um, you know, online forums, platforms. And also attending RIA, uh, Real Estate Investment Association meetings. That's a strategy you want to pursue. Another one is to develop um, a strong negotiation skills, develop your skills uh, so that you can negotiate with uh, sellers uh, once you find something and also negotiate with uh, buyers uh, so you can assign your contracts for, for a profit. 
uh, know your market where you are, and uh, you know, and also make sure you're compliant with uh, with legal and the regulatory uh, requirements uh, when assigning contracts. You are dealing with contracts, so it's got to be legally. You need to understand what you're doing. And uh, so it's going to protect your interest and also protect the interest of uh, your buyers and sellers as well. Next strategy uh, is going to be a uh, short term strategy. But before I get there, if you've got some questions, please put them in the chat box and I'm going to get to you in about a few minutes. And I'm going to speed it up a little bit. Uh, I've got a few more strategies I want to talk about. But if you've got some questions, put them in the chat box and I'll definitely get to them uh, shortly. So the fourth strategy we're going to talk about is uh, short-term rentals. Uh, this is a strategy which I've, I've, I've actually done. And, uh, but it's not always as easy as what people make it to be. Uh, I know a lot of jurisdictions are cracking down on uh, short-term rentals. Uh, and, you know, and uh, a lot of investors have been burnt by them uh, because they, you know, they bought a property with the intentions of... Uh, you know, of uh, doing short-term rentals, which the, the, you know, the cash is, you know, the, the rent is higher. But, uh, you know, the jurisdictions, the local jurisdictions have, have clamped down. Uh, Washington, D.C. has clamped down. Uh, New York has clamped down. San Francisco has clamped down. A lot of places are clamping down on them. So, uh, you know, be careful. Uh, you have some great ideas, but you could be stopped by factors beyond your control. So the question then becomes, uh, how can uh, investors like you and I maximize our rental income through short-term rentals? Um, so as I said before, short-term rentals are, you know, the idea is to buy a property and, uh, you know, you put it out there on platforms like uh, Airbnb, VRBO, uh, Booking.com, and some of these other platforms. So you're going to offer it to, um, you know, uh, travelers, vacationers, short-term people are looking for a place for a short-term days, weeks. And there's a new term called midterm, which could be months. Uh, but typically, you know, short terms is, um, you know, less than 30 days. So you put it on these platforms and you're trying to entice travelers and vacationers and people are looking for a place for weekends, days, weeks, or whatever it is, and, uh, and so on. But to be successful as a short-term rental investor, it does require effective marketing. You've got to be able to um, make your listing very, very attractive and appealing to potential clients. Uh, you're going to need some property management skills because you're dealing with people living in your home. And uh, you also have to have skills in guest management. Uh, but again, the idea here is that the short-term rentals, you can get higher rent uh, compared to uh, long-term because people are typically paying by the day or, or by the night or by the week, uh, which is usually higher than what you'll get with a long-term renter. So you can, in theory, get greater uh, cash flow, greater return, and, uh, and compared to your traditional long-term rental. That's, what, that's the reason why it tends to attract a lot of people. However, you know, to be successful in this strategy, um, you know, it does require you knowledge of strategic pricing. You've got to price it, uh, your property uh, accordingly. You've got to be able to market. And as I said before, guest management, you're dealing with people who are very transient, and going in and out of your property and ratings becomes very, very important. Your reviews become very, very important. And therefore, you've got to be able to manage uh, those things. Guest management, I call it. Uh, bad reviews will, will, will have a huge impact uh, on the desirability of your, um, of your asset. And, uh, and so uh, that's something to be aware of. So uh, you know, if you want to maximize your rental income and achieve uh, you know, high rental yields, you know, you, you've got to know certain things and uh, certain things like deep understanding your target market, who you're trying to appeal to and what a guest looking for. You can you know, provide uh, experiences, uh, which hopefully will be attractive to potential guests. Uh, additionally, I think you're going to need to understand marketing and prices because price fluctuates. Um, you know, where your property be, uh, will be, uh, is located. It could be events going on. Uh, it could be seasonal, um, you know, and therefore you want to price or adjust your prices accordingly. Um, a lot of, um, you know, um, platforms do allow what they call dynamic pricing, where they have algorithms uh, whereby they can change the, um, the rent 
you know, uh, based on local factors and uh, and so on. Um, yeah, I mean, I've tried it before. Um, I, I don't think I'll do it again. And uh, it's not always cracked up to be, but you know, it's a lot of work because people are going in and out of your property, and you got to have systems in place whereby uh, cleaning companies. If you decide to outsource it, then you're gonna have to give it to a management company and they're gonna take 15, 20, 25 percent of your revenue. So after all the costs, you you, you know, you're including utilities typically, uh, electric, gas, and water. Um, you know, after you factor all those things, it's not always as as at least I haven't found it to be as, as uh profitable as what I thought it would be. And it's just a lot, just a lot more work. I just rather personally, just me, I just prefer to just get somebody in my house, a voucher holder. They stay there for five, 10, 15, 20 years. They're happy. I'm happy. And, uh, and I don't have to deal with the daily hourly, you know, transitions that take place with short term rentals. But with that said, uh, there are a lot of people doing very, very well, uh, in this strategy. And therefore who am I to criticize, uh, each to their own, but it's a great, um, you know, niche if you, um, you know, if you want to pursue it. And uh, there are certain things that I think if you're going to pursue this strategy, there's certain action items that you may want to consider implementing. Uh, one is uh, optimizing, you know, your property listings uh, on these various platforms, Airbnb, VRBO, Booking.com, etc. You want high quality photographs, you want detailed descriptions, and you want to have competitive pricing. Another action item you want to do is uh, really need to brush up on your customer service skills, uh, you know, because you want to enhance the guest experience and generate positive views, a review, sorry. Uh, you want to implement dynamic pricing if you can to maximize occupancy uh, rates and also, um, you know, uh, rental income during uh, peak, um, peak seasons and, uh, you know, changing seasons as well and events. And also, you need to be stay informed of local regulations. As I said before, a lot of uh, local authorities are clamping down on Airbnb short-term rentals, uh, and so you don't want to make sure, you want to make sure you don't fall afoul of uh, local regs. Otherwise, you could get fined. Uh, next strategy number five. Let's have a little time. Seven thirty-four. Okay, I'm not going to have time to do, cover everything. So let me just quickly go through house hacking and a couple more, and I'll wrap it up. So house hacking, uh, that's a strategy which uh, I've pursued. I think it's a wonderful strategy, um, you know, in order to maximize your returns on owner-occupied investments. So the question becomes, how can investors like you and I maximize housing costs, minimize housing costs, sorry, generate passive income through owner-occupied investments? So house hacking, uh, essentially, uh, it, it's you buy a property, buy an asset, it could be a single family, it could be a multi-family, and you decide to rent some space. So you may rent a room, you may rent the basement, you may rent a unit, uh, but the idea is that you're getting additional income uh, from this asset uh, that, uh, you know, and the, the goal is to drive down your housing costs. So uh, I recall the second house I bought, uh, I bought that house specifically for the reason being that I could rent part of it. So uh, it was a three-bedroom house, and it had a basement. So I rented the basement, uh, so I got one income there. It had three bedrooms upstairs. I lived in one of them and rented the other two. And the other two that I rented out, uh, plus the basement, the money I was getting, the rent I was getting from those three units was more than my mortgage. Uh, and so essentially, I was living at that house for free. So my housing cost was a zero. And because my housing costs uh, was zero, and, and as you know, and all know, housing costs is usually the largest expense that most people have. Uh, because my housing costs were so low, I was able to save money. And I saved money, saved money, saved money. And that money that I saved, I then used that to buy house number three and four and so forth. So if, you know, the point is, is that if you can't reduce your housing costs, because that's the biggest expense most people have. It's 30, 40% of most people's income is housing. If you can drive that down, then it allows you to save a lot of money. And with that saving, then you can start building reserves and hopefully use that savings to buy uh, appreciating assets. So that's the reason why I really do like house hacking strategy. And that's the reason why that I did it. Uh, essentially, the house which I lived in, um, it was paying me. 
you know and uh so you know a lot of people want to save money but they can't because uh all the money is coming in is going out and so if you want to save money you got to focus on the big ticket items you, you know not going to starbucks you know and not having a latte or a cappuccino you may save 10 bucks five bucks whatever that's that's okay but it's not gonna it's not gonna make you save a lot of money or not going out one evening is it's okay but it's not going to save you a lot of money you want to hit the big ticket items and the big ticket items items are housing and transportation and food okay um uh, you know saving five dollars at you know uh, mcdonald's or whatever is fine but it's, it's not going to do anything uh, if you could save five hundred dollars by getting a roommate or a thousand dollars by getting a roommate now you're talking now you can save some real money and uh, and that's what i mean is that you got to focus on the big ticket items like housing and if you can drive the housing costs through a house hacking strategy that then allows you to save it, you know there's some inconvenience you're gonna have some roommates yeah i get it uh you're gonna have to rent a space yeah i get it it's not exactly what you want but it's the means to an end and uh it allows you to get onto that train and allows you to start saving money which is really you're going to need that because uh if you can't if you don't have any savings if you don't have any reserves it's very hard to no one's going to give you 100 percent financing so you're going to need to have some reserves you're going to have, need to have some savings and house hacking is a strategy that allows you to do that uh it you know it's it's not easy like all things uh you do require um you know you're going to deal with tenants uh so customer service skills is going to be important uh you're gonna have to uh you know deal with uh, issues that goes wrong in the house and all that stuff that typically you'll have with a with a tenant but you know if it's done correctly it can de definitely generate uh passive income it can uh save you a lot of money and uh you know it, it could be a pleasant experience i had a pleasant experience with my tenants you know uh and i you know especially if you can have the tenants away from where you are you that way you don't have to interact with them maybe in the basement somewhere uh then you know you can live your life they can live their life and everyone's happy uh but obviously you're gonna need to maintain the property collect rent and deal with tenants all the way so what are some of the action items if you want to pursue the uh, house hacking strategy identify multi-family or properties that uh are viable for house hacking opportunities and desirable living arrangements uh develop a you know detailed financial plan outlining you know your mortgage costs uh, uh rental income and how you can hopefully generate some cash flow from this uh you're gonna need some property management skills and uh tenant skills tenant management relationship skills is important and uh you know you can also look at uh financing especially if you're going to live in the property things like fha uh some of these owner occupant properties and, and programs va and so on which can help you reduce your down payment requirements and also to ma maximize the returns as well uh, a couple more i'll do before i wrap it up one which i know we, we haven't really spent too much time on this uh syndications um you know syndications things like uh, pooling your resources in order to buy larger buildings so how can investors participate in larger real estate deals through syndications yeah you know, i say real estate syndications is uh where it's really you're dealing with larger deals it could be um you know office buildings multi-families commercial industrial and things like that uh the idea is that you you know you're pulling uh capital from multiple people in order to buy a larger deal um it's a bit more sophisticated uh it does require more due diligence and understanding more legal structures and uh and also aligning with uh, experienced people experienced sponsors and so on it's not something that uh, a newbie should do without uh, getting some uh good advice and hopefully working with other people a bit more seasoned more um you know than you are uh but it can be very profitable and uh, so who am i to say you shouldn't do it you should definitely explore it if you're okay with that uh potential higher returns uh there are risks obviously and complexities in this strategy and there are legal and regulatory requirements that you have to comply with and uh, things like uh, the investment terms and also sponsor qualifications uh let's keep going number seven is lease options 
Uh, I've done that before as well, uh, where essentially you are. So the question, I suppose, is how can you, as a real estate investor, uh, profit from uh, lease options? Uh, lease options offer, you know, the ability to uh, to essentially lock up a property uh, for a predetermined price, and uh, and hopefully, um, you know, lock it up and uh, buy at a future date at a at today's price. Um, you know, I, I've done it before, but more on the other side where, uh, I'm, I have tenants. It's like a rent to own, I suppose, uh, where I'm offering the property, giving tenants the opportunity to buy my homes, um, you know, um, by renting them first, the rent with the option to buy. That's how we go. Okay. So, uh, that's an opportunity. And, uh, and finally, let's go to another strategy, which is tax lien investments. And uh, this is another strategy which uh, a lot of people have been very successful at. And uh, so essentially here is people don't pay their taxes. And at some point the government's going to, you know, um, you know, uh, sell the property at a tax sale. And uh, if you're the highest bidder, you get what we call a tax lien certificate. And that gives you the right uh, after a, uh, you know, uh, a holding period uh, where the the, the owners have the right to redeem, uh, you know, their property. And if they do that, then you'll get a return on your money, your interest. And uh, so that's, you'll get a return on your money. If they don't redeem it for whatever reason, then you can foreclose and buy the property or take the property from them. So it's definitely a strategy. I, I haven't really pursued that strategy very well. So I'm not too familiar, but I know some people who have. And uh, at worst, they just get a, a high return on their money. And at best, they actually get the uh, the property uh, back. But most people don't usually, you know, lose their home, uh, especially if it's a decent home, uh, just because for the cost of the taxes. Uh, so it's a strategy. Uh, it gives you higher returns to your money, and uh, it does. There is a redemption period, as I say, when the owners have the right to take the property back, and so on. It's time seven forty three. Okay, I'm going to wrap this up now. And go to Q&A. So if you've got some questions, let's go to Q&A. And uh, in conclusion, the path to prosperity, is there are a lot of opportunities, as you can see, and a lot of challenges, uh, some valuable lessons learned. And uh, whether it's fix and flip, buy and hold, uh, lease options, tax liens, short-term rentals, syndications, whatever. There are lots of different niches, lots of different niches. Which one makes the most sense for you? That's up to you. Uh, but uh, either way, there are successful people doing it. And I think that real estate is, is great uh, asset class to be in. And I think that if you pursue, you should be okay. Just pick the strategy that makes sense, learn it, become an expert if you can, associate yourself with people who are successfully doing this, and you too can learn from their experiences. And therefore, you too can, be su can become a successful real estate investor. So that is my friend. So if you got some questions, put them in the chat box and I'll definitely go to them right shortly. If you go and shoot me an email, uh, you can reach me at joe at joeasimo.com, joe at joeasimo.com. And uh, as usual, if you want to book a one-on-one -on -one meeting with me where you can, if you've got a question, a problem, issue, a challenge in real estate investing, book a one-on-one -on -one with me, ask Dr. Joe. Go to my website, uh, www.joeasimo.com, www.joeasimo.com. Press the button for Ask Dr. Joe, and then you can pick a time and date that makes the most sense for you. It is not free. There is a cost. It's $175 for one hour, which is very, very reasonable. Uh, I've done quite a few of those sessions. I've got two more going on tomorrow. Uh, they've been great. Uh, I think I've provided a lot of value for people. And so, again, if you experience the problem or challenge, don't get stuck. Leverage my experiences, leverage my knowledge, and let's do a one-on-one. -on -one. My goal is to help you so you can implement and reach your real estate investment goals for 2024. So if I can help you, book a one-on-one -on -one with me, and I'll do the best that you, I can. And uh, before I go, let's the uh, question of the day. What do you understand by the term successful real estate investor? I can tell you what I think a successful real estate investor, to me, is someone that has control over their time. Um, they're leveraging the power of real estate, uh, the cash flow, tax benefits, appreciation, leverage, 
um, you know, to, uh, to, to, to create opportunities to take control of their life, make money, uh, do what's important for them. It's not all about just making money. It's all about doing good as well. That's what I enjoy about being a real estate investor. And I consider a successful real estate investor is someone that's building wealth and also someone that's doing good. And that's my definition of a successful real estate investor. What is yours? Let me know and I'll get to you in a second. So let's get down to Q&A. Okay, that's what we got today. We have Dow2. Hey, Dow2. Uh, greetings from Phoenix. I'm sure it's hot over there. Uh, hello, DMV. What's up, Joe? Dr. Joe. Hi, Kelvin. Hope you're doing well. And wealth and wellness with grace. Someone who has achieved their real estate goals. That is exactly uh, a successful real estate investor. Someone who has achieved their real estate goals, whatever that is. And uh, everyone's different. Uh, I, I really enjoy uh, providing housing to Section 8 families. I think it's, I don't know, just helping other people who are less fortunate. And, you know, and I, I just enjoy it. And, um, you know, and here and just sitting down with my tenants and just, you know, talking, chit chat and, uh, you know, see how I can be of assistance on their journey. So, yeah, it's all good. Let's have a look. Uh, hello from Louisiana, Wealth and Wellness. Louisiana, which part of, well, which, well, which part of Louisiana are you in? Uh, let me know. Okay. Ike, MP. Hello, Dr. Joe. Hi, Ike. Hope you're doing fine wherever you are. Uh, Dr. Joe Kelvin, what are your thoughts about ADU strategy for the DMV area? Good way to maximize rent. Uh, ADUs are accessible dwelling units. Uh, it's a strategy which is uh, being, I think, promoted by the DC government, whereby uh, you can create these accessory units. It could be a garage. It could be something away from the main house. And they're allowing zoning and permitting to be a lot easier now than it used to be. Um, it's definitely a good strategy if it can make sense, whereby you can now get additional income uh, from your property uh, that you otherwise could not. So you can now, it's almost like a form of house hacking, really. Uh, you have a property which is away from where you may live, and uh, you can find a tenant. It meets code, hopefully, and you can get additional rental income, which will offset the expenses. So yeah, it's definitely a good way. Uh, I haven't done one at ADU, but I know several people who have. And uh, as long as you can navigate the permitting and the zoning issues, uh, and you can make the most sense out of it, it's definitely uh, something worthwhile to consider. And now you have an asset, you're maximizing the, as you said here, you can maximize rental income as well. Okay, uh, wealth, and wellness, wealth and wellness with grace. Uh, I recently started purchasing tax sales and just adjudicated properties. However, we have a three-year redemption period in, in, in Louisiana. Okay, what exit strategies would you recommend for both? Thanks. Oh, my goodness. Three years. So what uh, Wealth and Witness is saying, Wellness is saying that typically, uh, let's just say uh, I own a property at 123 Main Street. I don't pay the taxes uh, you know, for a period of time. It could be months. It could be years. At some point, the local government, the city or the state or the county is going to say, we want our money. We want our taxes. And uh, they'll give you warnings. If you don't pay, they're going to sell the house at a tax sale. So there'll be a, a tax sale, which is scheduled. Uh, it's posted, it's advertised. And on that date, uh, you know, at the location which they advertise, people start bidding. And typically they start at the whatever the, the delinquency is for the taxes. And whoever bids to the highest gets it. So, uh, well, I don't get it, but gets what they call a, a tax lien certificate. Now, what Grace is saying is that that um, the person who got the highest bid, they have to, the owner uh, has up to three years in order to uh, redeem, um, you know, that property. So, although she bought it in 2024, she may not be able to start the foreclosure process until 2027, three years from now. And so the owner has up to three years to redeem that property or the tax lien. So when, if they do, then um, uh, Grace will have uh, a return on her money, uh, and, uh, but the owner can you know, redeem that property by paying uh, the, the tax plus whatever interest is authorized by the state uh for grace's money 
So that's the only downside with three years. I know around here it's usually a year. So people have a year to redeem. Most people do. Uh, and so, so at best case, you're just going to get a better return on your money than just sitting in a bank account somewhere. Uh, so in terms of exit strategies, you know, people use it as a higher interest savings account uh, because you get a better return than, uh, you know, stick it in a CD. Uh, but the worst case scenario or best case scenario, you can actually own an asset which you could foreclose on. And then ultimately you can sell that at a profit. So uh, I think it's, it's a good way to go. I know a couple of people are into tax liens. I'm not really into that, uh, but I know some people are, and they've done quite well. So uh, definitely something worthwhile to consider, uh, Grace. Okay, get lobster. Hey, how are you doing? Uh, thank you so much for teaching us. You're welcome, as usual. I'll do the best that I can. I tried short-term rentals. It didn't work out for me as well. I tried short-term rentals. It's not always, it's not always cracked up to be. Uh, I know these gurus are you know, peddling that stuff. Uh, it's just a lot of work. And uh, I just didn't, yeah, I, it was just too much work for me. And uh, so I outsourced it to a management company. And those guys took 20% uh, of the income. So 20% of them rent coming in, they took. And then, you know, there's cleaning fees. Uh, you know, there's utilities. You got to have internet. Uh, you got to pay for electric, water, and gas wear and tear in the house. It's just, you know, it was okay. Uh, but I'm, I'm definitely not, you know, a proponent of that strategy. But again, who am I to say? Uh, some people are doing very, very well. So please, um, you know, speak with, work with those people and they can share you with you some of their secrets. Uh, get lost that we are finally have our first investment property in the contract. Congratulations. It's a 27-year-old three-bed, two-bath duplex could you please share what inspections you may consider requesting in addition to the general inspections? Thank you. Okay, so Get Lobster's uh, got a house in the contract, an investment property. I think it, well, she doesn't say, or he doesn't say what type of property. I'm just assuming it's a residential um, property as opposed to a commercial. And uh, it's 27 years old, which is not really that old. Uh, here in the DC area, you got houses that are 80, 90, 100, 110, 120 years old. So 27 is not not old at all. Uh, so what kind, you know, if it's 27 years old, so you may want to check the uh, the plumbing, the electrical, the heating system. Um, definitely want to do that. It shouldn't be too old, so you should be good. And I don't think, uh, well, hopefully, uh, you know, 27 years is what uh, 20, 80. It'll probably be in the what the early 70s, uh, 70s. Uh, no, it's not 70s, it's going to be 90s. Uh, so it should be good in terms of the electrical systems and the major systems in the house. Uh, you may want to get a home inspector just in case you want to check the foundation, see if there are any cracks, check the roof, uh, check the windows, check the doors, uh, check the floor in. Um, you know, do usual the usual due diligence that you'll do on any particular uh you know property uh so a home inspector will give you some good ideas uh, otherwise you can have a contractor if you're going to do some renovations you may want to get a contractor in there so you can explain to the contractor what, what contractor what do you want to do and uh if you want to make it into a four bedroom like for example to add an extra bedrooms uh where is that going to do so where are you going to do that which rooms are you going to take any walls out you know and so on so I think it's maybe worthwhile to have a contractor in there and so you can develop a scope of work and get their opinion. And then you can then decide how best to move forward. Good questions. Wow. Okay. Where are we? Uh, it's now 7.55. I've got five more minutes. We are inheriting her tenants in both, you know, gosh, you're inheriting tenants, one of which pays cash for rent. Do you have any ideas for transitioning them to cashless rent payments from day one? But doing so on a positive note, yes, I would definitely. I, you definitely, I definitely, you definitely don't want to accept payments with cash. It means that you have to physically go to the house, collect the money, walk around with money in your pocket, and then you become a target. Uh, so I would say that uh, you work with them, uh, you know, to pay you electronically, either by Cash App, Venmo, Zelle uh you know you can give me a bank account uh typically what I, if you want to do that i would set up an account 
with a bank that has lots of ranches uh, in your area. Uh, so that way, uh, it's easy for the uh, the tenant to go to a local branch. Um, you know, there should be a local branch not too far away. So I, that was something. I'm, if you're going to set up a bank account, uh, do it with a bank that has several branches close to you. Uh, most of my tenants nowadays have Cash App and 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 uh, and Venmo and Zelle. So, uh, so, you know, so I, I think you would, you want to encourage them to do that. You may want to maybe give them a little break. Uh, you know, if they do electronically, maybe you knock off five or 10 bucks off the rent. Um, yeah, that could be an incentive for them. So you, you gotta, you know, I think it's much, much better to, 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 to pay electronically. There's a paper trail and, uh, you know, you don't have to go running off to the, the house to get the money. And they obviously you don't want them to mail you money, uh, otherwise the money is going to go missing. They're going you're going to have to deal with that. So uh, I would say you want to incentivize them to pay electronically, and usually the biggest incentive is money. So either you could give them a discount, or you can increase the rent uh, uh, if it's paid by traditional ways, and therefore get a reduction or the, 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 the regular rent if it's paid electronically, if that makes sense. Uh, okay, let's keep going. Marlon, hey Marlon, how's it going, man? Hope all is well with you. Um, IKMP, can we expect an, an, any in-person networking events in Washington? You, yeah, good question. I may do it. I may do a networking event at one of my properties. Uh, I know we've got Femi, uh, one of my students is, uh, he's doing very well. Congrats, uh, Femi. He should be wrapping up his rehab this week. And then we're transitioning over to the tenant selection next week. Uh, very proud of him. He's turned his four, four bedroom, two bath into a six bedroom, four bath. Uh, I may, and we're definitely going to do an event there. Um, I may do one of my, one of my properties, which I've owned for 10 years. And I'm going to sell that house. Uh, so I may do a, 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 an event at one of my houses uh, here in Washington, D.C., um it's either going to be in a couple of weeks or a month from now i'm going on the cruise it's my birthday february 28th so we're going on the cruise we're going to turks and caicos jamaica bahamas cayman islands and a few other places uh so that's where i'm gonna be spending my uh my birthday yeah um, 28th of february huh and uh but in mine's in jamaica so i'm probably gonna maybe i'll spend a day over there with 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 him while he's there anyway uh my favorite strategy is buying whole hey johnny hope you're doing well and uh, hammond and baton rouge louisiana okay baton rouge louisiana welcome thank you dr joe appreciate what you do thank you james and my friends it is now eight o'clock i'm gonna wrap it up for the day and again hopefully today was helpful and the next week is going to be Valentine's uh, Wednesday. So I will not be doing Wealth Wednesday. We're going to do a recording. So uh, so there'll be a recording. I won't be live next week. And also on the 20, I'm going on the cruise on the 25th. So for that week, I won't be doing it. It's the 28th. I will not be uh, doing a, uh, a Wealth Wednesday because that's going to be my birthday. And I'm going to be out of the country. So I'm good. my goal is to go out of the country three times this year. So this is trip number one to uh, Bahamas, Jamaica, Turks and Caicos, and the Cayman Islands. We're heading out from Florida on a seven-day cruise. So looking forward to that one. Have a little break. And then we may go to uh, Uganda and Kenya and Tanzania later on this year. And we are definitely going to Ghana uh, this year. And maybe a couple of other places. So we'll see. My goal is three countries. Last year I did five. This year I'm going to do at least three. And uh, and so on. Okay, my friends. I uh, hope you had a, a wonderful week. And again, if you have any questions, if you feel like you can be, I can be of assistance to you, you know, book a one-on-one -on -one Zoom meeting with me. Go to my website, uh, joeassamoa.com. If there's anything to do with real estate, uh a problem a challenge a tenant a landlord uh a strategy acquisition whatever it is uh if you feel i can be of assistance to you book a one-on-one -on -one with me and i'll do the best that i can to help you 
sometimes, uh, you know, um, we, you just need more time with me than what we can during uh, the live stream. So I created this opportunity for you to do that. So my friends, have yourself a wonderful uh, week and uh, happy Valentine's to everybody. And uh, I will see you, my friends, soon. Take care. Bye for now.